Welcome back to another edition of Higher Education Today. I'm your host, Stephen Roy Goodman. I'm here at the University of Cape Town, where we're going to be speaking about micro-credentials. And I have three guests with me today. Nadia Starr, who's the CEO of the South African Qualifications Authority. James Kivi, who is the Chief Executive Officer of JET Education Services. And Trudy Van Veek, who is the Chief Director for Social Inclusion at the Department of Higher Education and Training in Pretoria. Welcome to all of you. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Well, thank you all for coming on the show. Maybe, Nadia, if we can start with a simple question, which may not be so simple, but what is a micro-credential? What's the definition of a micro-credential? Hmm. Thanks, Steve. Um, we have, I think, no real common definition of a micro-credential. Certainly in South Africa, um, at the policy level, we've not yet decided really and agreed what a micro-credential is. Um, that doesn't mean that we don't have micro-credentials happening and at play in the, in the system. Um, and so really, I think what we're doing is at the moment borrowing a little bit um, from definitions elsewhere, the European Union and others, and trying to work out what those definitions might mean in a South African context. Um, but things like short programs um, underpinned by quality assurance, based on learning outcomes, things that you know one can see in terms of skills and competencies, um, and, and really, you know, part of an assessment system seem to be the sorts of things um, that, that are defining micro-credentials for us. Well, let's say I decided I wanted to take up dancing and I wanted to take a class. Hmm. What would you do with that from your perspective? Yeah, that's an interesting one. As a policy uh, maker and as you know, the entity SACWA is responsible for our national qualifications framework, at this stage, we would do nothing with that. Um, you know, there is no space for it. Um, it doesn't mean that it's not valuable, you know, for, for you and your social life um, uh, and your, your, your citizenship, really. Um, but as a, currently, in terms of the policy in South Africa, it would happen outside of the regulated uh, space. And speaking of the regulated space, James, if I understand this correctly, uh, your entity deals with uh, very large entities in terms of that regulation. So what would you do with somebody who wanted to learn how to dance? Interesting you use that example because I, I, my wife got me to do exactly that, Steve, a while ago. Now, the dancing class didn't go so well, but the, the takeaway for me is, you know, is that something I want on my CV? And so the kind of things we talk about micro-credentials are a lot of different skills and competencies that sometimes people want to put on their CVs, but an employer can't verify. And this is the problem with the regulated, non-regulated space. You know, the learning that is regulated gets verified. So when I put it on my CV, an employer can easily check, you know, this is authentic and I can give you the job. The dancing class is like difficult to verify. So the difficulty with micro-credentials is around the authenticity and the verification. And what about the issue of employability? So the mm. dance example may be a little bit extreme, mm. but let's assume I were to take a class somewhere. Uh, are you trying to measure whether or not a certain percentage of people get jobs after that? Difficulty in countries like South Africa is, you know, the longitudinal data is weak. So whether it's the BCom degree at UCT or whether it's the coding course that I do at, a, at an NGO, it's very difficult for us to track that. So I think one of the biggest issues we have in a developing country is that we can't always answer that question, whether it's for a non-formal micro-credential or whether it's actually for a BCom degree. So I think there's a lot of thought to go into this. Um, but you know, my main takeaway around micro-credentials is it's like a CV on steroids. If we can get into a system, and in the US in particular, I'm seeing a lot of this kind of stuff happening through entities like Credential Engine and uh, Lumina Foundation where they're trying to build a system that the data is actually you know, interoperable, whether it's the dancing class or the coding course or the BCom degree. And when the data is interoperable, employers can ask those questions better and we can better track where, the, where people end up. Fair enough. And Trudy, from the perspective of the government, so not that you represent the entire government, but you do work for the government. So are you worried about the fact that sometimes we can't recognize a degree or we don't know whether or not a student's going to be learning a certain amount? How, how do you deal with that? Steve, uh, I think it's a very important question that you're asking. It is the recognition of learning that has taken place. And we don't have in South Africa a system at this stage, like Nadia said, that recognizing learning outside the National Qualifications Framework, or as we call it, the NQF. And we would like to see 
because specifically if we look at employability, it's not about the degree or an official qualification or a recognized qualification per se. We're looking at knowledge, we're looking at skills, we're looking at values, we're looking at attitudes. And all those things are very important in a job. So if we look at from the employability side, and that is one of our main objectives as a government, is to produce employable people and the employability of people, we have to look at others than only formal qualifications. But it's then also, how do we recognize it as government? And we have to balance it between formal recognition and recognition that can lead to formal assessment if you want to go into a qualification. So I think we have a lot of work to do currently in terms of how do we recognize, for example, short courses, because that is at this stage a currency that's very important in South Africa, is we do short courses of three weeks or we do a short course of a month or two, but it doesn't necessarily lead to a qualification. But how do we recognize that learning? And we have to grapple with that, and we are grappling at the moment with that issue. Well, and speaking of the grappling, we're at the University of Cape Town, which is a major university. And we, the crew that's taping this show right now, they happen to be doing a short course learning television production. But that's is a major university and a well-regarded university. But let's assume that a few people decided to offer a short course uh, in some area in Cape Town or Johannesburg on their own. Would the government not care one way or another? Let's say two people said, well, I, I'm very good at video production. I'm going to start my own short course and come on to my house and for three weeks and we'll teach you video production. I Yes, you say the word care. Government cares a lot about it. And we really care about the person who's learning in a non-formal situation. Because learning is taking place everywhere. I'm learning at the moment how to communicate mm -hmm. in, a, in a different setting that I'm used to. But how do you recognize that learning? So it's not about the learning. We care about the learning and we really care that people do short courses. And if you have listed, listened to the Minister of Higher Education and Training recently, he says at several occasions we have to build the skill set of people. And employ people who have done short courses and so on. So it makes people more employable. But the recognition part is lacking at the moment. And again, we don't want to regulate everything. And I think that is very important mm -hmm. if you look from government side. Is Overregulation is really not the answer to a skill shortage like South Africa and the employability problem in South Africa. We have got a huge unemployment rate in South Africa and we need to skill people and not necessarily have to educate people. So it's education, training and skills development that we have to focus on. So yes, that is a, a big thing that we still have to work on. And I think that is where people like the South African Qualifications Authority and Jet Education Services are very important for us to assist us also in the global perspective and the national perspective and see how can we best recognize learning in a formal, non-formal and informal way. That's interesting. And you referenced JET a second ago and Sakwa, but James, in terms of JET, you work around the world in terms of doing some of this work. So is there something different about the micro-credentials in South Africa than in other places in the world? I think it's becoming more, more of the same. Uh, you know, Trudy said a couple of interesting things in Nadia. You know, the, the issue here is, you know, how do we describe learning? And we use learning outcomes. And so the common currency we're seeing in South Africa, in Africa, and around the mm -hmm. world is a learning outcome can be used to describe knowledge, skills, competency, value, all the things that Trudy mentioned. So if we have a common currency, then whether we talk about a micro-credential or a formal macro-credential, a qualification, the currency that we're using is the same. So if the currency is the same and we put all of this onto one system, then the interoperability between learning, whether it's formal, non-formal, or informal, doesn't matter so much anymore. I was part of a session, an uh, uh, online conference just a week or so ago, and, and the discussion was around current competence. That was interesting. Mm -hmm. A lot of the stuff we do is looking back. So you did the BCom degree, you did the dancing class, you did the coding course. And all that stuff needs to be certificated and there needs to be authenticity and validation. But actually what employers are interested in now and more and more is like, what is your current competence? And, and they actually they've got more sophisticated methods of testing your current competence using AI and other tools. So I, I see a move away from, from a lot of the things we've been working on for many years. 
And I'm part of the SACWA board, and I often challenge Nadia on this stuff, and I know she's watching me. Don't go too far. <laughs> but I, I, I'm finding that the formal systems we have around the NQFs, I think they're going to become dated in the next 10 to 15 years because of exactly this topic that we're talking about. And if I can respond, We please. would be delighted <laughs> to hear that response. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't, I don't disagree with uh, James in this respect. Um, I do in, in others. Um, but I think, you know, the one area where... We, as a policymaker, and you know, as as essentially the custodian oops, of the regulated system, we, we we really struggle with micro credentials per se, and bringing the informal and all the other good stuff into the system, um, is that micro credentials, and I forgot this in 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 my definition, are being defined really as technology based. That's and this true. interoperability, you know, mm -hmm. it, it must be fancy technology. I must be able to, to with a click of a button, share what I want, etc. All fantastic. But in a context like ours, where we have massive inequality, poverty, uh, mm -hmm. and unemployment, where we have rural communities that are not uh, mm -hmm. connected, where we have data costs that are exorbitant, that becomes my challenge. Sure. That you know, the micro-credential debate, if we're talking about it as a technology-based um, you know, program, uh, will for us, I believe, our, our, in, in our population, create a divide. Um, short courses and mm. micro programs that you know support a learner to have some level of skill that they can use is absolutely fundamental and should and and and, and is really continuing to happen but i think we as south africans really need to have the conversation about how do we enable the sort of technology um to to support all of us and not just those that are able to um, access at the stage well that's an interesting question so let's assume we were having this discussion in Pumalanga or Limpopo. That's a very, those are different places than Cape Town and Johannesburg and Pretoria. So are you suggesting that you don't use the cell phones to do the micro-credentials or that you create more land-based things because there are more rural uh, people who are going to access things in person? Yeah, I mean, look, I'm suggesting that we be more considerate and deliberate about, you know, how we borrow policies just because it's working you know in the in 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 the in the global north doesn't mean that it can be transposed um, adequately to a, a community like limpopo or mpumalanga um, and let me say also that our population i think the last stat i heard was about 95% penetration in terms of cell phones so cell phones are not an issue um, but the very sophisticated technology learner management systems etc that are used um, to 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 manage these programs, um, I think right now becomes difficult um, for certain communities, um, and one must think about communities uh, who have gone through youth who have gone through schooling and have never really worked with a computer, um, and then ask yourself how would that person access a you know a micro credential that is only online and requires quite sophisticated um, engagement with the technology um, but that being said i don't think it's an insurmountable challenge and we are connecting our communities more and more i think the data costs will you know remain a, a challenge for now um, but it's about as i said being deliberate about how do we define the micro credential and how do we create different categories so that different communities are able to access um, and leverage the, the power of a micro-credential. And so really my only, my only um, caution is that it can't only be, you know, these digital badges as, as a category of mm. micro-credentials. Mm. What we're seeing here with the UCT students, I think, is a fantastic example of a valuable micro program um, that might and hopefully will lead to mm. employment and other opportunities. Um, and, and these are the sorts of categories of micro learning that I think would be useful for us right now. May I respond? I don't want that, that shouldn't be a dialogue, but some interesting <laughs> things. Okay. So, uh, you know, a couple of things for me, I think, sure, and Nadia, I completely agree, you know, a large part of our population, many African populations have this problem of connectivity. That's not going to go away, even with cell phone presentation. So point taken. You know, my, my pushback to government, both, perhaps to both you and Trudy, if I take my NGO hat for a, for a while, is a lot of the back-end stuff is a government responsibility. Mm -hmm. So the sophistication of the systems and, and all that kind of stuff, the person living in Pumalanga doesn't even need to know about it. Mm -hmm. The person in Pumalanga must be able to take a very cheap cell phone, not even a smart cell phone, and be able to see what their CV looks like online and that an employer can see in a way that doesn't cost them anything. 
One of the biggest problems we have in South Africa is that our citizens pay for their own data. So when I have, for example, a qualification on the National Learners Record Database, and I didn't use an acronym, you got that still, <laughs> uh, that you, what you find there is whenever I want to verify something, I've got to pay somebody. Mm. And, and my pushback to that is, but the data belongs to me as a citizen. So why do I need to pay or the employee needs to pay to verify all these things? So my pushback there would be, firstly, let's, let's do the back end stuff, the complicated stuff for people, and it's not on them to do it. And the second thing, maybe a broader, more international debate around this is, I think internet access should become a human right. This is really, a, you know, this is a, perhaps a little bit left field, but a lot of the UNESCO discussions are now are starting to go in this direction. You know, we, we haven't for a long time looked at the, kind of what are human rights in a global world at the moment. And it feels like internet access should be right up there. And so we should really be focusing on that because with internet access, we can leapfrog in so many ways, particularly as developing countries. Mm -hmm. I still don't take away what Nadia said. We must be careful of deepening inequality. Mm. You know, we can think about fancy systems and fancy things and the unintended consequences are always there. So we do agree halfway. <laughs> Good enough. Yeah. As a government official, I think I have to respond to this because <laughs> it's, it's not for me the learning aspect that we, that's for me the problem at the moment because learning is taking place anywhere. It can even mm. take place in my own home without electricity. Yeah. But for us from government, is how do you recognize that learning? And I agree with James in this regard, is how do we capture that learning? How do we capture it in a way that it's accessible to both the learner, but also to the employer? So that mm -hmm. this, and, and I like the way that you see the online CV, is that there's a verifiable way of looking at your say a, p a potential applicant that I can look okay but this guy is not only having a BSc for example or a bachelor's degree or whatever you call it but he also has got voluntary work that he's doing mm, exactly. he's volunteering at a, a, a local church or at a local mm. community and through that he learns soft skills like communication skills like empathy those things you can't measure mm. but that is a a way of representing that learning. And that is why I think government's responsibility is to develop a highly sophisticated system with a very simplistic access way that it, you mm -hmm. are accessible. And I think South Africa's banking system is one mm -hmm. of the best examples because mm -hmm. everyone in the, in even the rural areas can access their banking online. And with, through mm -hmm. a very simplistic app, it doesn't mean that the back end is simplistic. And I think that's where government has to play a very important role, is how do you recognize that learning firstly, mm. but secondly is how do you capture that learning in such a way that's accessible to the learner, it's accessible to the employer, but also verifiable. And I think that is another way that we must be very careful and not to say everything must be externally assessed and quality assured mm. and that, but it must be verifiable. And we look at very different issues here. We're looking at professional designations, for example. I am registered as a teacher to teach, but is that a formal recognition or is it just a paper that I have got? And those are the kind of things that we have to grapple with, is the verification of such credentials. And, mm -hmm. and I think we are opening a door at the moment that is so exciting and so I think it's valuable not only for the for the learner or for the person who's learning but also for the system and the employer and the employability of those people and I always come back to our high rate of unemployment is how do I really know I get the best candidate and I have got a view that says the person who necessarily with the degree is not the, not necessarily the best uh, employee, uh, employer for me in government, for example. Interesting. What about new knowledge? What about something that doesn't exist yet and somebody's doing some research right now and they come up with something that we don't even know how to evaluate it because it's so new? How would you deal with that? Again, I, I think we must be careful with the evaluation, quality assurance and those kind of things because... Uh, it, when you're looking at the skill, uh, you, for example, you develop a competency or a skill through that research. That can verif be verifiable regardless of what the topic mm -hmm. is because you are researching a topic. So the, the skill that you got is a research skill. It's not the topic skill. Yeah. But the way that you interact with the knowledge 
is for me a very important thing. And that's not a tangible way of, of verifying that. I, I can't verify. If I'm a better researcher than, than James, for example, if I don't look at my research output, my level of of, of, of engagement with content and how do I interact with that content. So it's very difficult to verify it and it's very difficult to assess it, but you can still recognize it. Mm -hmm. And and I think mm -hmm. we, oh, okay, we're playing with words and I think mm -hmm. we must, must, must be very careful not to just play with words. But I feel that recognition is a formal pro or is a process of recognizing learning that's taking place in any context. And if somebody wants to assess that, it's good for you. You do the assessment, but that it's recognized that James has done his dancing class. It's fine. So at mm. least he, he can do mm. something like marching or a, <laughs> or a tango or whatever. <laughs> can I build on that, uh, Steve, just for a second? So, you know, verification in the work that we're doing has got three levels. It's mm. a gold standard. Mm. The gold standard is like the SACWA stuff. It's like it's a degree, there's assessment, there's uh, certification, there's graduations, you know, that's the gold standard. But that's also the most expensive and the most difficult one. Mm -hmm. The next level is peer verification. It's like a little bit of a LinkedIn kind of thing. It's like I say I did something and my peers say, hey, you're really good at the research mm -hmm. or not the darn thing, but <laughs> something else, okay? And so that's on the peer level. That's a bit softer, eh? It's mm. not on the SACWA NQF mm. level. It's a little bit softer, but it's still pretty valuable. And if I look for somebody to employ a JET and I go to the LinkedIn profile and I see that all these references that are on the peer level, that's kind of important for me. The third level is, is the softest level. It's the self-reported stuff. It's like, I think I'm really good at something. Mm. My peers don't attest to it and there's no really gold standard around it. And what, what we're seeing in our work at the moment is that all three levels of verification can actually be put onto one system but they must be flagged. It's a little bit, I'm thinking of the WhatsApp blue tick. I don't know why I'm thinking of that. But it's like, you can, so if, if I'm an employee and I go onto the system, I can see gold standard, clear, UCT, BCom degree. The next one I can see, oh, this, this person's peers really a, a tester. And then the third level, I'm like, yeah, I'm not that interested there because it's kind of stuff this person is saying that him or herself. But think if we live in a world where we, we have the interoperability across all these things. On a system where an employer can actually ask, you know, what can I employ Steve? You know, what did Steve do on all three levels of verification? And I can choose which level I prefer. And then I can also, when I do this checking, I have to ask the individual. And I just want to stress that as well. Mm. This is the part we often forget. I don't ask SACWA or the department or the employer. I ask the individual. Sorry, I'm going on too long, but this is an important part. Mm. If I could also weigh in on this one, Steve. Um, I mean, I agree that there are these levels um, and, uh, you know, the gold standard to the self-attested stuff. Um, but I think what's important in the conversation about micro-credentials in a context like South Africa is that all of it is necessary. Mm. Um, we, we have to have a differentiated system. And through the department, mm. we've been working, you know, at the university level, at the college's level, TVET, vocational stuff, so that even in the gold standard, everyone is able to find a place for themselves and able through that learning process to, to you know, um, be productive in their lives, uh, whether it is community-based or economically. But what is important is that the regulated system, the SACWA systems, the gold standards of the full qualifications, those, are, those have important spaces in, in the economy and in, you know, in life but they also needed to be add, need to be added to and supplemented mm. current knowledge, the, mm. the new knowledge. Um, and the way one builds new knowledge in a formal system is absolutely through research um, and, then, and then recording possibly, you know, from, from a sort of informal level and then formalizing it. But also one builds new knowledge through your lifetime and, and you know, having, a, a, having the ability to say at this stage, I need to pick up just one week of doing a certain thing is important whether you have the basis of the gold standard or not. Yeah. Um, and, and I think also, you know, what's important for, for our conversation and to talk about your, your new knowledge um, uh, question is that there is, we've seen particularly after the, the pandemic that things are moving so fast that if we did try to regulate everything, we would break the system. Um, and I always use as a regulator, I use the IT uh, uh, you know, um, sector as, as, as an example, where IT companies as peer reviewers have said, this is what we need, you know, the C++'s and I'm sure there are more 
uh, uh, current uh, programs. Um, you know, those things are not regulated. They don't sit on our systems. They're not BCOMs, etc. But there are important learning programs and competencies that sit there and that are attested to by that environment. And for me, it's important as a regulator to say that that, is, that needs to happen. Um, I'm not necessarily in agreement that it all needs to sit in one system, sure. uh, maybe accessible by one person. Um, but I am... I fully support the fact that we must have those differentiated uh, spaces so that you know one is able to have the agency um, to choose and pick up what you need, what you're able to do, what you're able to afford, and what you're able to to really leverage off um, you know at any stage in your life. And James, since you guys seem to be agreeing all the time, was there anything Halfway, you wanted 50%. to say? <laughs> Look, the thing that I would want to just put into this debate as well is we're talking about micro-credentials, not micro-qualifications. Mm. And that's a really important kind of shift that the world is going through because a credential is more than a qualification. A credential is the license to practice that uh, Trudy spoke about. To be a teacher, I've got to be licensed, a doctor, a nurse, an accountant, and many professions. So that's a credential. A credential is also my banking profile. Uh, Trudy ex uh, used the comparison with the finance sector. So this idea of a credential that is more than a qualification is a really important part of this discussion. And you know, the more controversial side of this is that machines also have credentials. So it's not only humans that have credentials. So when you start going into this territory and you start talking about the tech, and, and I do agree that it limits to this, it's actually where you get to a point where the algorithms and the machines can also have credentials that can coexist with human credentials on those systems. Now, I say that in particular to challenge Trudy and, and Nadia a little bit, but this is the reality of where we're going as a world. Mm -hmm. And so we've got to be careful here. The question then comes in, what is the ethics of these things? Mm -hmm. And how do you build it? It's not about can we do it because that technology exists. It's about what ethical principles to be in place to, to manage this from a kind of human-centered uh, way. Unfortunately, we only have about 30 seconds left, but Trudy, you get the final word since James just challenged you on the... Uh a number of points there. I think the challenge is taken because I think as a country, we have to look at our citizen and we must look what's best for the citizen at mm -hmm. the end. It's not what's best for government or best for SACWA or for, for the system, but it's what's best for the people on the ground. And we must make sure that there is a way that that person has got valuable in his living and that and it mm -hmm. has got decent employment and decent life. And that is what it's about. Thank you all very much. This was a really interesting discussion. If you would like more information about micro-credentials and what we've been speaking about today, please go to sakwa.co.za or jet.org.za or dhet.gov.za. If you would like to send a note to me at the show, please go ahead and do so by sending an email to today at topcolleges.com. And thank you for watching. We will continue to bring you quality discussions about important matters in today's college and university world. I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, and you've been watching Higher Education Today.